Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Narratives of Grace, the Pastor's Corner. I'm your host, Pastor Caleb Barrett. So we've been having some uh, health concerns in our church, so we aren't really able to be here together, or at least not outside of our own household. So uh, today, Naomi and I are going to be talking about worship. Hello, guys. It's good to be with you here today. Uh, specifically, we're going to be talking about our worship journeys. Uh, I don't necessarily like to put it that way because the Bible tells us how to worship. It's not purely preference. And maybe we'll talk about that a little bit. But we're going to be talking about the different views that we came with, the different um, predispositions that we came along with. Uh, because they were very different, and actually our views when Naomi and I first met on worship were probably pretty opposite, uh, at least in part because I wasn't a believer, but even what I did believe was probably opposite of her her side of things. And we're still like that a little bit. We're way more to the center, but I think I think we balance each other pretty well. Yeah, I think so. Uh, but So I'll start uh, with... So we're going to look at this and... and time period so we're going to look at before we met while we were in college while we were in seminary and since then and we're going to do it that way because those are really the four ways the four time periods that our views really changed on worship and i think it's important to understand your view of worship and how it lines up with scripture uh so we're in part doing this so that you can think through it a little bit and we can talk about what worship really is um, so worship isn't music. Music is worship, but we are going to focus probably uh, more on music than other stuff, uh, at least for today. Uh, both uh, our education and trainees on the music side, but we have education on the theology of worship too, but we're going to focus a little bit more on the music for today. Uh, but before Trinity, before we knew each other, before all of that, uh, really, I didn't really go to church regularly until I was a junior in high school. And even then it really wasn't for the music, uh, or it wasn't for the worship. It was at that point, it was because I was going with a friend. And then my senior year in high school, I went to sing in a choir. And that's really the first heavy regular worship that I got was, uh, high church. Um, and I mean that in every sense of the word of high church, everything except for the incense, uh, organ, choir, um, all of these things, robes, uh, pastors included, not just the music, not just the choir. Everybody wore robes. Um, now, and where was that again? That was at the Congregational Church in my hometown. In? In Connecticut. Yeah. Um, but, that, I mean, you, any Congregational Church, you're going to see that kind of a thing anyway. But it, it was very high church, but it was f almost more of the ritual and and. And I'm not talking about that church. I'm talking about my perspective at that church. And I went to a, a Navy free church with my grandparents occasionally, but that wasn't anywhere normal until later. But I do consider that my home church. Um, but that was much more blended contemporary. Uh, but I saw worship more in that high church feel. Um, but what about... How would the high church look like in on the East Coast versus anywhere else? The only real difference, East Coast versus anywhere else in the country, I think, and I haven't been to tons of high churches outside of Texas, Connecticut, and Illinois, but I think most of it is that because Connecticut has a longer history, and that I would say this is going to be true in New England uh, mostly, um, and somewhat down the, the East Coast, but primarily in New, New England, New York um, area, is the, the high churches are going to more focus on the, the old school uh, like home country, uh, old country kind of a thing. It's it's going to be typically older buildings. That church, I think, was built in, in 1720 or so. It's beautiful. Oh, yeah. It's an, it's an amazing building. And, in fact, the, the high school, my high school, we would do all of our concerts there, and we were able to do that because the music minister was also the choir director. But we did every major thing there because it was just the most beautiful space anywhere in that area. Um White, at least in the town. White building, tall pillars. 
Yeah. yeah it, it pretty much is when you say high church, it's kind of what you expect in like old school New England church, uh, which maybe I'm the only one that has an image when I say that. But if you search New England church, you're probably going to see this church or at least something pretty similar to it. Um, and that really was my pull. Even after then, I talk about high church stuff, but it's just because there are some good examples that you see in that. But your experience was basically the opposite, I think. You grew up in church, and the style was never really high church. Not that you didn't appreciate it, but that was never your guy's style. Yeah, I mean, similar to Weathersfield. Weathersfield is the other church that I went to that was more blended uh, contemporary. Yeah, kind of similar to um, the church churches that I grew up in I actually early on I guess I need to give a little bit more of a backstory um my mom grew up in Christian Missionary Alliance Church and my dad was mostly Baptist um so there was kind of an interesting um uh different sides coming together and my dad's way of thinking was a little bit different, a little bit more um, conservative. More traditionalist. Yeah, more traditional. Um, but anyway, I we, at an early age, up until probably junior high, I was at a Christian Missionary Alliance church. And it was a great church. It was um, a little bit further of a driving distance for us. But um, it was great because we had a lot of different opportunities that... Um, we were able to do music with. Um, So they had a huge choir. They would do big um, productions for Easter and Christmas. They um, had a lot of stuff for the kids. They had children's choir and a way to do theater, drama during the summer. Um, It was really the best place that I could learn all the arts um, at an early age. But, uh, you know, eventually it kind of became too big for us because it was starting to get a little bit mega churchy. But that was where a lot of um, where I started to think about worship started. Um, Yeah. And so it it was much more contemporary. Mm -hmm. Um, And I mean, Annandale, which is still where your family goes, is much more contemporary. It has a little traditional splash to it but and much much less now i think than the way you've described it to me when you were a kid right yeah yeah that it it had occasional hymns it ended with a hymn but now it's it's pretty much i would say contemporary and it's in its style which Mm -hmm. isn't worship but that's just the kind of Mm -hmm. vibe that we're bringing into the the discussion so that's just Mm -hmm. kind of the background from both of us so that I came much more formal high church. Now we came more, um, uh, Im- more informal structure, more contemporary feel. Um, very conservative, but conservative. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it wasn't like the, like anything goes run up on stage. If you get the feeling or anything like that, it still was, it still followed the liturgy. Like we mean it. With, with its core thing the work of the people the service was more or less the same structure week to week yeah. uh, fairly predictable in a positive light you knew what was going to happen at different points mm-hmm. most of the time that we have this many songs and then this and this many songs mm-hmm. and then that and then the preaching and then this happens after the preaching kind of a yeah so a big part with my area that actually kind of affected the way that we did worship is the whole idea of um it it was a country area it was very rural um and pretty much most people are commuting either commuting to their work um large distance into the city or farmers or people of trade Mm -hmm. um so that also kind of had an impact because people were just coming to be fed rather than to be a part Mm. of something um it was a little bit different at river riverside but at annandale that was kind of the vibe so the people that 
served in the worship team that was the there was a very s- small few of us that served there yeah um but a huge thing that um I, i'd like to emphasize on my early childhood actually um was the summer camps i would go to um summer camps every every summer and um, it was actually there where I re- rededicated my life to Christ. Um, and it was because of the music and worship. Um, it was, let's see, I think I was, mm, it would have been when Blessed Be Our Name came out, early 2000s, I think. Yeah, I think that's like 2001 or something yeah. like that. And or at least that's when it was popular. I don't yeah. know, it may come out earlier. Yeah, so, um, and I think that was the last summer I went to summer camp. Um, and... So that song was kind of like a theme. It kept coming up every yeah. day that we had worship together. Um, and I remember thinking, oh, you know, how it says, um, blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. And then also blessed be your name even in the bad times. It mm-hmm. was the first time that I was like, oh, like this isn't just just worshiping God you know, because it feels good. It's like, I'm going to, I need to dedicate my entire life to him and like to continue in this. It, um, it, I really felt God for the first time at, in, and this is why I say this is important because from that point on, I viewed worship as an experience Yeah. at that point. So and and that's one of the big things there in different views of worship one is that worship is supposed to be an experience uh and there's there's a few different in that category of of what some will call a, a worship taxonomy and and it's how you view worship a little bit more broadly than just your style of music uh but the experience model is is one of them um but anyway so then we we go to Trinity Naomi was at Trinity a year earlier than I was uh, because I transferred in later, but Trinity was a, a major shift in that in a lot of different ways. And I think for both of us in a lot of different ways. And I, I know for me, it was in large part because of um, the fact that I was studying church music. I came to faith I, at my, my concentrations were music theory, composition and church music. Uh, and so that the, that's a large part of what I did. Um, and I actually didn't do it with the intention on becoming a worship pastor. I did it with the intention on eventually becoming a professor to study and teach this because I felt that it wasn't studied enough. That um, at Trinity, the the church music classes had to be taught by the music history professor. Now, she did a phenomenal job with it. Uh, so don't hear me saying anything negative about that. But it was an area that wasn't uh, focused on in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it really did impact me to have that historical view. And I've taken other church music classes from a historical view. And I think that that's powerful, Mm -hmm. um, a different way to look at it. Um, but it, it was at Trinity that I started considering the more, that idea of traditional contemporary feeling versus acting, uh, worship being, being fed or, or offering a sacrifice and all of these types of things. And it was a lot just because of the background that I had. And I will say it it loosened me up. It brought me more to the center of things that it doesn't need to be all hymns, but I had a lot of good influences, both in professors, but also friends. Uh, One of them being uh, Kyle, who is a a good friend of ours still. And, and, uh, um, there's several others, but he was one in particular that kind of helped me see a little bit more of a, a balance in the two. And th- that's kind of where I started focusing on that blend a little bit more that you don't need to throw out the hymns for the contemporary, but you don't need to shun the hymns for the, excuse me, shun the contemporary for the hymns. You can have a little bit of a balance in this. Yeah, it's true. Um, I was really grateful that growing up, I, I had a family that really appreciated music of all of all kinds and you know we grew up singing hymns even though for the most part the churches we attended were pretty contemporary it was also kind of blended too but like i was singing the old 
like gaithers and gospel stuff with my you mom. Were, you were singing the traditional, not well, the old necessarily, and at least in the, the broad spectrum. Yeah. Uh, which is usually when people say the good old hymns, they're not talking about Martin Luther 500 or let all mortal flesh keep silent 1200. Uh, it's more of the late se- or, ni- or early 1900s rather, uh, which isn't bad. It's just uh, yeah. funny. It's true, but also we we did learn a lot of the early early hymns. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but but quick, let me uh, interject. Because I think the things that changed in both of our views were different. I mm-hmm. think your style of music hasn't really changed substantially. I think you may have shifted from blended toward contemporary to blended toward traditional. But I think your your view on the function of worship changed. Mm-hmm. Where my view with the function of worship, it, it was more or less always there that, that worship is an act of sacrifice. But my view on what music could be served in that purpose is what more changed. Mm. Uh, Both of our views on both sides changed. I think it just, it was, it was more in that way. Yeah, for sure. Mine, the biggest thing in my view that changed, changed in a huge way. Um, I guess, you know, in, into Trinity, what everything that I had gone through prior to that was, like I said, experience driven, I would go to conferences and, you know, I, I was seeking that experience constantly to be able to feel God Mm -hmm. in a powerful way. Yeah. And that was huge for me. So coming to Trinity, um, I was excited to connect with, you know, Christians, um, because it was a Christian school and to be able to study music and to be around people that actually liked to worship, um, so like very soon I connected with a small group of friends and we would have worship nights and um, there was even a student led worship night that happened every week. And I yeah, that started a few years before we got there. It was called the yeah. uh, fat uh, faithful, available, teachable. And it was actually started by the football team. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of thing that I love with Trinity, because at most schools, even Christian schools, the athletes are kind of put into the like well they're here they're believers but are they uh are are they as much are they as committed but the the sports teams at trinity are not that at all that there's there's known the people that are there because their parents made them be there but that that's going to be true of pretty much any christian school Mm -hmm. uh that has normal quote-unquote college degrees whereas somewhere like southwestern only has seminary-based degrees even at the college level uh, but at Trinity, it was just a completely different thing. Like there was no more or less. There was no one in the Christian ministry department saw themselves more dedicated to the faith than somebody in the education department or somebody in the athletic department, anything like that. It, it would that that spoke a lot to me, and that's part of why I went mm-hmm. to Trinity. Interesting. Yeah, I can see that. But that the, back to worship. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I would try to go to those worship nights and it was definitely a very loud and exciting experience that was how they you know young you i guess from 18 to what 22 year olds <laughs> it was the primary some grad yeah. students went some grad students helped and, and spoke there so there were some older but by far it was primarily the college not the seminary side and i remember just how loud it was for one thing but then there was also a lot of people that were on the more Pentecostal um, side of things. Um, And actually, I remember during these worship nights, they would get to such a heightened, excited... Worked up? Yes, worked up energy that um, some of them would start, you know speaking in tongues and um yeah i was never there for that and getting excited and there's i'm not saying there's anything wrong with being excited for jesus we're all for that here um but it was very interesting because i got to see a different side of things and well there's a difference between worked up and and enthusiastic or excited about jesus Mm. And I know from my experience of things like that, usually the worked up is y- you're looking for that feeling and that's kind of what comes out. Yeah. 
Mm. And it's usually far more unhealthy and ungodly. Not that, and, I, and this isn't me making any claims on things like speaking in tongues. That's a whole nother conversation that I'm happy to have, but not for this place. But a lot of times that I saw things like that, which I never actually saw that in particular at Trinity, but in that setting, a lot of times that I know of, it, it's more of the worked up into a lather than true commitment. Mm. And that that's not speaking across the board. But yeah. generally speaking. Yeah. So I started, you know, questioning and trying to figure it out for myself because I thought it was very interesting. And I was it, I felt wrapped up in the excitement as well. Um, so I guess that was my first year at Trinity before I even met Caleb. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was an interesting time and it really tested like what I believed about worship um and i guess going into further into my education at trinity i i think i started to level out and to see where um see where that can be not the best way to think about worship it's it's definitely a spirit and truth thing it's Mm -hmm. it's you can't have just the emotions the emotions are, you know, we're human, so we're going to feel things. And when we want to worship God with our heart, you know, things like that might be a side effect. But you really need the truth and the, you, know, the word and and what is, what exactly are you singing about? What are you praying? Is it biblical? Is it, yeah, truth? Yeah, and and that and that's a big part of it. But so, our views started to come a little bit more to the middle, um, as we kind of went through Trinity. Um, we had a lot of disagreements on what worship was in that way. I didn't see the emotional um, goal as a good thing, even before being a believer. And honestly, I think that's part of what delayed me and and holding on to christ in that way and not that that that's you that wasn't you per se but from seeing that on other places that well the goal is to get emotional but that i I don't see that in the bible i see people being emotional for jesus but that's not the goal that's the result Mm -hmm. um and those are are two different things and i think Mm -hmm. one of the biggest shifts on my view of worship in that way and it was shortly before i became a believer was um, a, a lecture from that class on my music and worship class. Mm-hmm. Um, the professor's father came in to speak and he's got all sorts of fancy degrees and was a pastor and professor and all these other list of things. And I, I, if I remember correctly, he has multiple doctorates and all this stuff, but he taught on Isaiah six and <clears throat> his view and explanation of the Isaiah six model uh, in worship and specifically that the goal of worship should be to change really shifted my view completely it has nothing to do with our effect it has nothing to do with this this or that but it's coming before the throne of god to Mm -hmm. affect a change for him to change us Mm -hmm. um and this this um pastor professor said that if somebody's not changing in our service regularly then we need to adjust it uh that doesn't mean that somebody needs to change every week or everyone needs to change every single week or we need to keep a calendar of when different people change But if there's not a change, if it's just something where people come and have a concert and leave, you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that that is really what started that process Mm -hmm. and that shift of my view on on worship. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of young Christians or those immature in the faith, it's, it's easy to think about worship as if it's for us, Mm. as as though we are getting something out of it. But I really think in between, you know, for both Caleb and I, and I think mostly me, <laughs> I I don't know at what point, probably in my seminary training, I, I think when I finally realized, you know, wor- worship is something that I am doing for God, mm-hmm. not for myself. I mean, I, may, I might enjoy myself while singing, while praying yeah scripture but i think the focus needs to be that 
this is an act of service, just like you're saying to him. Yeah. Which, and that's part of the goal of the Isaiah 6 model. That's a large, which you know this, but um, the idea behind the Isaiah 6 model, <coughs> excuse me, the idea behind it more broadly, um, and uh, I'll have some videos coming out uh, in a few weeks on the Isaiah 6 model with the Milani Minutes, but it, it it's that it shows that worship is a conversation. God calls us to him. And, and we respond, and then he does this, and we respond. It's always that we're responding to him. He doesn't respond to us. We respond to him. So when we come before him because he's called us to him, and we act in, and serve him in that way, he responds. Mm-hmm. He changes us. Um, and, and, you know, I, I obviously agree. It's not that the goal shouldn't be that we get something out of it. That that shouldn't be the goal, but that doesn't mean that's not going to be the product. Mm-hmm. If our goal is to serve God well, that will always be the product. Mm. Um, but so so our our views started to grow. They started to shift um, after graduating and getting married. We went to Southwestern, and and that's really where our views became more mature. I think mm-hmm. after Southwestern, it was more how to practically apply some of these, because um, you can learn about how to practically apply stuff all you want until you're actually doing it it's a different thing but our our undergrads were bachelors of arts in music and i had mm-hmm. church music and you had performance and, and all these things but southwestern our, our masters of music are both in church music mm-hmm. uh, they only have one master of music they have different concentrations mm-hmm. uh, so in actuality you and i have the same masters we have the same church music classes at the seminary level the only extra class in that category that i took was a reading class Mm -hmm. on how to do research so it really so you and i have at this point the same training in church music but when we got there i think the big thing that started to make the biggest change for us is that the soon-to-be director of the church music department or worship music ministry department dr annual uh and he's my advisor with with my um, worship studies can still now um, I'm taking a class with him starting next week. Um, it's that we started going to his church mm-hmm. and that's because that was the church of one of our professors from Trinity that ended up uh, moving to Texas to teach at Southwestern. He's now somewhere in Kansas, um, but that was his church. So we went there and I ended up getting a job there as Dr. Annual's assistant mm-hmm. um, and serving there with him serving there in that context is really what changed my view completely Mm -hmm. it took what i had learned with the isaiah 6 model and all the other aspects of that and just shot it like a bullet took it and just kept going Mm -hmm. um and that church is a high church functionally and in that way it's it's a baptist church it's southern baptist all these things but they they sing hymns uh they they only do hymns they high uh organ um all of these things uh, so I was really comfortable with that part. That part threw you off for a little while. It's not that you were uncomfortable with it, but it just wasn't. It was a lot more of what I was used to than what you were used to. Yeah, I really liked it, and I I liked the idea. I liked the idea of it a lot. Um, but it took a while to warm up to the idea of just hymns. Yeah. And I love the hymns, but I think I was like, huh. Like I s- I still like the contemporary songs too. But I also, you know, in seminary, I, I grew to realize why the hymns are so powerful and mm-hmm. why, you know, they're a lot more theologically sound. Mm-hmm. Typically, yeah. So, yeah. Well, and people say that I don't like contemporary music, and I know you've heard, you've heard me describe it in this way, but the thing is, I'm a lot harsher with contemporary music judging it, but it's because people have already done that to the hymns. They've mm-hmm. already run through the filter uh, mm-hmm. Fanny Crosby wrote thousands of hymns and we sing 10, I think now. Mm-hmm. Um, and really we primarily sing one with the, uh, blessed assurance. There's, there's several others that are in the hymnal, but it's, it's, le- it's like, <coughs> it's less than a percent, I think of what she actually wrote. Mm-hmm. And it's not cause she wasn't good. I'm sure the other things were valuable. It's just that those were the best. Yeah. And so that's yeah. kind of what I'm doing with contemporary music. I'm putting it through that filter and I'm, yeah. I'm making sure that we can still use it in 10 years and it's still going to be sound. Yeah. 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 That's a huge, huge thing for us is the, um, filtering out the music. And, yeah. um, we both love the hymns for the reason that Caleb just described, but we also, there's a lot of value in the contemporary music. Um, 
you just have to sift it a bit. Yeah, got to work um, through it. Yeah. But actually, um, for me, I was thinking back when Caleb was talking about the Isaiah 6 model and when he was first introduced to it. Um, and I remember at that point, you know, we were dating. We were still in college. Um, that was before we were engaged. Yeah. And I remember um, I had been a little bit struggling with figuring out. You know, I felt a little bit more mature in my faith. And I didn't realize at that point that... Oh, you were, because you had faith. Yeah, I didn't realize that Caleb wasn't a Christian, actually, at that point, um, around that point. Um, And I had been praying a lot that God would... That I wouldn't have to be the spiritual leader, because, I know, biblically, you know, if we were going to end up married, that he would need to be that. Um, So I prayed that he would you know, want to read the Bible with me or want to pray with me or any of these things. Um, and it's just interesting how, like, God was already working in him. And, like, he learned about the Isaiah 6 model. Um, I mean, I kind of knew about it. I think you're aware of it, but you hadn't, like, studied it like I was studying it. But it's just interesting that he took that class when I was praying that God would, like, make him more spiritually mature. <laughs> and I, o- I didn't find out about that stuff more in depth until seminary um so i'm i'm just thankful how much i've heard it from other people how amazing it is like god has worked in him in an amazing way like so quickly (laughs) yeah i'm thankful yeah (laughs) anyway um so really our our views of of worship matured there and understanding one of the biggest things that we understood was the difference between worship as experience and worship as an act of sacrifice mm-hmm. uh, i i described that as my view at trinity but it, i didn't actively know that i wasn't actively aware of it it was one of those i know this feels wrong but i can't figure out why mm-hmm. but it was through something in, in dr angel's worship class that really worked that out and it, it's with a I think I mentioned it earlier in this podcast, but the worship taxonomy, which I wouldn't mind going through another time, but that that's a little bit broader for this episode than I intend. Um, <clears throat> but that difference between active or worship being an active experience versus an act of sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think we see all throughout scripture, there's nowhere that you can find where it's an active experience. It's always an act of sacrifice. And it doesn't mean you don't get something out of it. Mm-hmm. You don't find that joy. You don't find that praise. You don't find that encouragement, but it worship like worship is is a life of sacrifice. It's mm-hmm. described that way in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it is literal physical sacrifice. You have to pay money to buy an animal to kill the animal. That's what worship in lo- in large part is. And then you mm-hmm. go before God and you can do the the praying and all the other things. Yeah. But even in the New Testament, is uh, Paul says, "Lives your life is a life of of sacrifice. It, it, worship is sacrifice. Um, yeah. That's what it is." No, it's true. And there might be some weeks that you'll show up to church and had hard week, or had hard morning, mm-hmm. or had a hard time getting to church. <laughs> and worship is difficult sometimes, and I mean, maybe not for for some, but I know that I have, at times in my life, had struggled just singing to God because the words were too true or mm-hmm. I felt too sinful or I just could not bring myself to worship a holy God. But that's the beauty of it. It's because we are so sinful and so depraved that God is he's already there with us and the fact that we're able to come before him is a gift well and you see that in the Isaiah 6 model which I mean you're overly aware of but it's that you know we come before him we adore him and then we almost immediately recognize our our unholiness Isaiah 6 woe for me for I'm undone for I'm a man of unclean lips and I'm from a, a people of unclean lips and my eyes have see, behold the glory of the Lord. I think I mixed three different translations in that. But and then what happens? God sends an angel mm-hmm. to burn away the sin. Mm-hmm. That that's what God does. And mm-hmm. so in that sacrifice, we need to remember this. And and I remember once. So at that church in Texas, mm-hmm. that was our, our that was our home church in Texas. We served several other places, but that was our church 
that's mm-hmm. where we held our membership the whole time until we moved to Hawaii. Um, if we go and visit a church, it's most likely if we had to pick one, it's going to be that church. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I worked there, like I mentioned, for, for a year and a half or so as the uh, uh, music and worship assistant intern, what I was called, changed depending on the day. But <clears throat> we rented a building. They still rent the same building. It's a phenomenally beautiful building. One, I would argue one of the most bu- beautiful buildings in Fort Worth. Mm-hmm. Um, but we had to set up because we rented. We didn't own it. We rented it. So every Sunday we would set up. Naomi would usually help with that. If she didn't help, it was usually because she was doing something music in the service and was it was setting up with that, doing something there. But there was one Sunday that Dr. Daniel wasn't there, and one of the deacons, who's now a pastor in New York, uh, was helping me set up. And there's a lot of little detail to it, and, and I put a lot of little um, touches to it whenever I set up. And he said, he asked me, do you, do you think everyone notices the little details that we do? And I honestly do think most of the people at that church do notice it. But my response was, it doesn't matter. We're not doing it for the people. We're doing it for God. We're putting in this detail. We're putting in this effort. We're putting in these little things as an act of worship to God, even in the setting up. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he was like, yeah, that's right. That's good. (laughs) And we just kept going. Like it, it, to me, it, it was a significant moment, something that I remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know how he felt about it in that way, but uh, he and I get along phenomenally with stuff like that, uh, almost too much, because anytime we were together, our wives were like, okay, <laughs> it's been four hours. You guys can continue this later. Uh, but I think that really puts it, hits the nail on the head with worship. You know, we can set up all of these things. We can do all of this stuff and wonder if anyone ever notices. But we're not doing it for the people. We're doing it for God. Worship at its core is a sacrifice to God. Now, mm-hmm. he is going to do something through that. He is going to affect us. We are going to get something out of it. Mm-hmm. But the goal shouldn't be enjoyment. Yeah. We shouldn't want to do this song because I enjoy it. Yeah. This song says something about God that I think his people need to hear right now. Yeah, and I think that's important, too, is that, you know, as me and Caleb are discussing music and, um, w- you know, we, we talk about w- the kind of the types of music that we want to have in the service. And it's not just our tastes or our likes. Um, it's definitely what's fitting, what what works for this part of the service. Um, so for sure, it's not it's not preference yeah and sometimes there's a little preference in there because that that does happen uh but it, it's not it's not based on the preference the mm-hmm. preference more shifts and, and guides but but it is structured around this idea this idea of what worship truly is mm-hmm. um and i think we need to see that in worship and now since coming here i think the biggest thing that i've learned is how to apply those principles into a setting that's fitting for that church. Mm -hmm. What we did at church of Christ, the King, what we did at first Baptist white settlement, what we did at Indian Creek Baptist church. And I can probably name 10 others that we've served at different levels at isn't going to work here. Just like the things that happen at those churches wouldn't fit elsewhere, Mm -hmm. but we've taken what we've learned and applied those principles here for what this congregation needs, even week to week, even as we go through this pandemic, what do we need to hear? Is there a song that we need to remind ourselves of? Uh, And the same that I do when I pick the scripture readings, it's what do, uh, what's going to help God's people right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, And I think you've seen the same thing. It's, it's how do we take those principles and now apply them in this setting? Yeah. Even recently we, um, were able to, take a hymn that is loved and i don't know how old it is guide me oh thou great jehovah um 1800s i think yeah i'm not sure i could be wrong but most people know the the tune guide me oh thou great jehovah a very major um sound major meaning bright and happy sounding um and there's this contemporary version that riley actually discovered and We listened to it and we liked it, Um, but the idea wasn't let's let's do this different song because it's contemporary. It was uh, let's take something that was old and revive it and bring out the 
um, the contemporary version that she chose was um, it has a more somber feel to it um, because of the way the music is set. Um, and yeah, and then just bringing attention to, you know, guide guide me, God, through through this guide me through this weary land um i'm weak yeah um but so that that's that's really our worship journey in different ways i think uh one of the most impactful passages aside from isaiah 6 is hebrews 10 and i'll read that passage in a minute and i actually did that for the middle of minutes this week um so if you haven't watched those i encourage you to do it because i really dig into what um hebrews 10, 19 through, um, through 25 is saying about worship, that it, that it is talking about worship in, in a large part. Um, but we're excited to be able to, to occasionally come together and talk about different aspects of, of worship. But it's important to know our journey to help see why we see things the way we do, that it's not flippant it's not random it's not loosely done it's not we were told this so we take it but we've taken the, the wisdom and knowledge from several other people through our experiences through our discussions through our study uh and have kind of come out with this and we still differ in a lot of stuff mm -hmm. uh but it, it kind of balances i'm i'm still more um traditional conservative high church nami is is typically more contemporary driven but those two come together in a in a good way, I think. Yeah, and I think, like like you said, we have very different backgrounds, and um, even for a time, I've I've played and sang at different types of churches, and I think um, that's helpful. Um, being able to see how other traditions do it. And to be able to say, no, maybe that's not the best way. And maybe that's not as biblical. Or, oh, I like that. Um, I like how they're designing their worship service. I think that's important. Yeah, and it is. Um, and maybe next time we'll talk a little bit about how our different studies have impacted our view of worship. Because like mm -hmm. I said, our, our masters are the same degree with different concentrations. But Naomi's pretty much studied performance and pedagogy i primarily studied composition and conducting with with some extra church music i'm doing more more advanced study in, in worship now um but really our views come out of that as well and our, our primary professors but that is a, like i said a discussion for another day but before we go i'm just going to read that passage hebrews um 10 19 through 25 i think we've read it in a service recently but it says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confessions of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet one another, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you that we're able to come together. And even though things are weird this week, that we're still able to come together and have this podcast and that Naomi and I were able to share about our journeys of, of uh, worship and, and the different places things were affected. Um, and I just thank you for all that you have shown us in worship. And I just pray that you help us to uh, share that with others, share that love, share that sacrifice with others and that they see that you, worshiping you is is an act of sacrifice. And yes, we get stuff from it, but it is first and foremost giving you what you deserve because you deserve far much more good and we deserve far much more punishment. And yet you have given us the grace that we may come before your throne, that we may draw near to you through the body and blood of Christ to worship you, to draw near and worship you in communion with each other and with one another with you. We pray that you help us to see what your true worship is uh, and and what you desire in that for for our church, but in uh, the church more broadly, uh, we we know that your plan is perfect in all things. We pray all of these things in your name, 
Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for this episode of the Narratives of Grace podcast. We pray that this was encouraging to you and you got to see a little bit more of of our process and how we think about worship, but also how we got to where we think about how we think about worship. If you have any questions or comments about this episode or any other or have anything you would like us to address in a future podcast, please email us at pastor at mbaptist.org. If you have any prayer requests, whether or not you're a member, uh, we want to be praying with you. We want to be praying over everything big and small. Uh, as a church, please email us at prayer at mbaptist.org. Uh, if you want to keep that just between the pastors or if you want it to go to the deacons or if you want it to go to the whole church, uh, you can just note that in that email. But we want to be praying with you. And again, that's prayer at mbaptist.org. For more information on Mililani Baptist Church, please visit our website at mbaptist.org or visit us on social media and YouTube. Thank you for joining us today, and we pray that you will join us again next time.